clap one on three. Hold on. Okay. One, two, three. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're so glad that you're here. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash. And as always, I am joined by my co hostess with the most S, Christy Oxborough. How are you feeling? Great. But I'm also like, I guess it's winter now. You know, it's chill. It's winter time. Yeah, it's definitely deep fall. It it has it has gotten chilly outside. Yeah. And I I was not prepared. Well, here's that actually segues perfectly into something I wanted to tell you about. I haven't told Christy about this yet. So I- I'm currently in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. What what a what a gift. What a gift. And I hear you. It's the seasons. They are a changing yep. with every season. Turn, turn, turn. Um, but here is a fun fact that I don't think that people outside of big cities, and I'd go so far as to say, I don't know if other cities even do this. So I don't, I don't know if this is a big city thing or a Toronto centric thing, but when you live in a big building downtown, they set days where they switch the system in the entire building over to heat or over to air conditioning. So in a normal home, like my home in Los Angeles or your home, I'm assuming (laughs) any day of the year, you could turn on the air conditioning if for some reason it got hot, correct? Yeah. There's a thermostat. You can set it at a number. Oh, I I barely know how to, I, I just, I leave it. And then if it gets if it gets really hot, I open all the windows and it pisses my husband off because he's well, like, just turn the heat down. I'm like, I don't know how to do it. Well, listen, the windows. I, what a privileged position you're in. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> let me tell you what's happened. And this happens every year. And I forgot that they turn it over like October 1st to heat. But the problem oh. is, is that it's not cold enough yet. And then the same thing will happen when they turn it over. Um, they wait too long. So they wait until like the end of May to turn on the air conditioning. So there's these two periods of time where for a few weeks, mm-hmm. you are absolutely roasting in your apartment. When I tell you how hot my apartment is, you're probably not going to believe it. So the caveat, first of all, that I give for this episode is if you hear a fan in the background, it's because I'm trying to survive. If you hear traffic, or people on the street yelling, it's because I have every window in here open. It ain't making a difference. It is currently 28 degrees in my apartment. Oh my God. Number one, thank you for giving that in Celsius, AKA Canadian. Number two, of course you would, because that's what's going to be on your thermostat. It's it's on the thing. Yeah, of course. But I converted it for for the Americans listening, 82 and a half. 82 Woof. and a half Fahrenheit. Woof. That's insane. It's also insane to just choose specific dates and go, we will do those ones regardless as to what the temperature said. Two days ago, it was like 20 degrees here. Yeah. Like it, it, we're having, oh. there's like El Nino, El Nino, whatever the whole thing. They're like, we're, the world's melting, whatever. Like if I look at the beautiful. forecast- if I look at the forecast for the rest of this week, yeah, by the end of the week, it's supposed to go up again to a high of 21. So no this is the other shit. thing is that it's like you just bake in here. So like literally, and the other problem is, is that, yes, I could leave the windows open overnight, but because I'm in downtown, God bless it. It is so loud with the construction early in the morning that it's like, it's just turned into this absolute hellscape. Bean and I are both like laying like, like um, no blankets, so hot. I literally Amazon this fan and it was supposed to get here on Saturday. Spoiler alert, it did not arrive until today, which again oh. is, I'm grateful for it now. No real complaints. Of course. But yeah, it's so hot and it's it's chilly enough out that you got to put a coat on. I got a couple toques. That's a beanie or a hat for the rest of the world. I got a couple new toques because it's chilly enough. But when I get back into this apartment after being outside, I'm like immediately like stripping everything because it's so hot. Anyway, this is the unsung. This is the thing you don't know about the condos downtown. This is the drawback. There is, again, two weeks, twice a year that are just hell on earth. Literally. Oh, my God. I 
I mean, look, I'll say it. I would rather have a home be too cold yep. than too hot because too yep. cold, layered up, get some blankets, get a hoodie, get whatever you need. You can warm, you can make yourself to a better temperature. Too hot, you're fucked. There's nowhere to go. There's no. nothing you can do. And the other thing is, is like, I can't turn on the fan. Like it's literally like the, you, the system only runs in one mode. So whereas for, in my my home, for example, right. I could turn on the heat or the air conditioning any day of the year. Right. And that's my right. Yep. It's my right as a, as a green collar holder in America. I have a right yeah. to change the, the AC to the heat as much as I so please. But it's again, and I don't know whether do, build, buildings do this in other big cities. I'm sure that people will let us know and tell me. But I, I again, this is the cross to bear. And I forget. I forget. And once you're over the hump, it's fine. Like once the it finally cools off, but I don't need to tell you or any Canadians listening will tell you that it's like, that's not how the weather works here. Inevitably, it'll get freezing and then there'll be another few hot days and that can last into November. Yes. I also love that I double checked the uh, weather app because I was curious. You're like, by the end of the week, it's supposed to be like 21. I'm like, it's going to be like minus five here. Why do they yeah, you're us? Why do well, I live here? Like that's that. Well, that's a question. I know. I've I've never fully had the answer for it. Um, oh, God. I mean, also to be clear, um, in a home, I would like it to be cold rather yeah. than hot. Outside, yeah. I don't want to say it, but I'd take a a plus forty day over a minus forty day to have to be outside wow. in. Yeah. I get if, that. If I have to walk around, I'd rather be like, oh, this heat is unbearable than it is freezing cold. Because once I'm outside, I can't handle the, the chill. Yeah. It's just who I am. Well, listen, I get it. I feel like the cold breaks you as a human too. When you do yeah. it for your entire childhood, you get to a yeah. point eventually where you're like, like I've said, I'm like, I typically, my parents come to um, California for Christmas because- if I never saw snow again, I would be fine with it. It, I, it's, it's, and people are like, oh, don't you miss it whenever it comes? No, I don't. Sure, it would be nice for a couple of days at Christmas. Don't need it. Have seen it. Yeah. Look, do it's I zapped my will to live year yep. after year? Yep. Do I want to like have a beautiful magic moment, like a Christmas Eve? large flakes floating down in the window and you're like okay that looks nice yeah do i want to shovel that fucking garbage the next day to be able to get to my own sidewalk i don't i don't no. do so, i want to no. feel the actual sensation of the water in my skin and eyeballs freezing yep. because it's minus 40 and you have to go outside and in order to see, unless you want to walk around in goggles, which maybe that is the answer, uh, you have to have something, mm -hmm. something showing. No, no human being needs to experience that. Mm -hmm. And let it be known that there are dozens of us, <laughs> dozens of us in Canada. No, there's thousands of us, but millions. But you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It does. It changes you as a person. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We are definitely harder. That was, I put some stank on that. I appreciated Canada, it. Um, then we would have been without growing up in harsh winters. Yeah. A hundred percent. There was, when I was at the Second City in Chicago, we did a song that was written by, shout out Emily Wilson, just one of the funniest women on the planet. She wrote this song about winter in Chicago. It sure. makes you stronger. It makes you crazy. <laughs> like the lyrics are just like talking about how it's like you feel hopeful. It, may, it makes you better. And then you want to kill yourself essentially is like oh, cool. how it changes because it's just so overwhelming. It does make you crazy when it's every single day and it's unrelenting and it's like, oh, it's snowing again. Yeah. Yeah. Again, like. There was that moment where uh, we had all gone to see you in California. And then because of snow and a blizzard that hadn't happened, but they could see it happening, we got our second flight got canceled before it started. Um, 
And so we had to stay in a hotel and we just wanted to go home. And then we finally get home the next day and there was three feet of snow that we had to like dig our way into our own home. And I can't tell (laughs) you how much not interested. I was like, yep, no. The snow. A cold California day (laughs) anytime. Oh, I get it. Like. I have no interest. When I was a kid, I remember there was one year the snow got so deep that it was impossible to clear it all. There was nowhere to put it. Oh, right. So it literally became, you would open your front door where you would essentially dug yourself out. You dug a giant hole. Right. And then you we kind of made like a ramp up and we walked on top of this like hip deep snow. Like we were all that one I, I, it never got that bad i don't remember it getting that bad any other winters but i remember that one winter like walking to school and all of the yeah. snow was like three feet high that we were all walking on because it was like there's no yeah. there's nowhere else it's too much we can't clear it there's no it's just not yeah. feasible or possible but do they keep kids home during those days those days not nope. back in the day no nope. maybe now they would they wouldn't back then um now the school won't close but school buses won't run at a certain temperature. But the school is we still, still had to go. I wasn't a bus kid. So the well, non-bus kids would still have to go when we went. And the the true joke of our lives, um, I live in a world of if my motto is if it's too cold for a bus, it's too cold for me. And I'm not interested. So I'm not going. So I always say, like, if it's too cold for the bus, I'm not gonna drive them. I no. don't want to deal with that. And uh, my husband is like, the house is quieter when they're gone. I will take a break from work to drive them. So he will drive them. Or if it's like ice, which that's my biggest issue with winter is the ice. Because I have, I remember like it was yesterday. And I swear to God, I had an out of body experience because when I remember it, I see, I can see myself. I saw it happening. I was walking home uh, from the the city bus, which I think has different rules than the school bus. But I was walking home and I just walked past a house. It the, the sidewalk looked clear. So I just walked as I normally would. And I hit a patch of ice and I, my feet went up and I was, I swear to God, perfectly horizontal and then slammed to the ground. And it hurt so bad. But I remember in that moment seeing my body like it was, I swear to God, I had an out-of-body experience. I saw the whole thing. And then I like limped home. And since then, I'm like, oh, I'm I'm gun shy on any. If I see anything oh. that looks icy, I'm like, nope, I, nope. The ice would get so bad in Belleville that I would slip at least two to three times a year. That would happen to me at least two to three times a year. And then our schoolyard, used to freeze over for whatever reason, it just turned to pure ice. And so you'd be like trying so hard and like the tiniest little shuffle steps and still ass over tea kettle slam down. I got so many concussions by the time I was like a teenager, I'd had, because I'd hit my head so many times on the ice. I should have been wearing a helmet to walk to school. It's not a bit. No, but that would have added some other stuff, right? Well, yeah, sure. Sure. Not not that I'm saying cool is better than safety. <laughs> that's not what I'm I guess that is I mean, kind of what I said. You as a uh, that's what I implied. Um, pop your collar over there, Danny Zuko, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Danny Zuko. Oh God. Oh, what a gift. Yeah, um yeah. well listen, before we get into it, what you drinking yeah. over there? Oh, uh, I did a Slurpee today because it is what it is. Well, the good news for me is I'm in Canada, so I've got one of my Mike's Hard Peach Fuzz, not sponsored by them. Love the product. Again, Mike's. We talk about you all the time. All the time. Whatever. People keep tagging them on socials. They're not responding. You know what? Do I follow them from my verified account? Let's take a look. Let's take, let, you know what? Let's get to the bottom of this in real time. Mike's Hard Canada. I'm giving them a follow now. Now they've been followed. Now it's on Mike's Hard. Okay. 
Yeah. Now it's on. Yeah. And look, we we talk about you all the time. Again, I mean. Oh, I, I guess we I'm should go- stop. I'm going back to my old. I'm going back to my roots by saying, like, do you have a hat? We're better than hats. We can't go back to hats. No. Oh, look, I also would like the product, but like. We're award winning. 10 million downloads. Come on. They can pony up. They can pony up. They can. They can. Throw in a koozie. Throw in a koozie. Listen. that's, That's what takes it next level is you get a free koozie. Well, I love that I'm still not even gunning for like a big cash payout. I'm just asking for product. You know, like I feel like at the end of the day, sure. we're still being very Canadian. But you know what? I, I don't think that business men would be uh, as as loose as this. So to that, I say, no. we'd like a deal, please. Yeah. Mike. A businessman would not have ever said their name bef- until getting. Yeah. Knowing we, that we, they're going to. We pooched it from the start. We pooched it from the start. No, but see, we're just two nice Canadian gals. Yep. Who enjoy a product. Yep. Let other people know we enjoy it. Yep. So, uh, I mean, mean, I'm not saying say thanks, but say thanks. What I'm saying is they should be putting us in a commercial. There should be a commercial for the product. Sure. That's what I'd be, that's what I'm interested in, Mike's. Wow. I'd like you to put us in a television commercial. Oh boy, now we're stepping up. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. Oh yeah, I'm skipping a lot of steps here. Yeah. A lot of steps. Yeah. Listen, you got to put it out there. If you want it to happen, you got to put it into the universe. You know, as we were saying that, there was a very loud noise. Oh, a fan thing just knocked over in my home. It's fine. I'm sure it doesn't mean anything. It was just a very loud sound to me. Is it the ghost of Mike? <laughs> I hope not. Yeah. I hope not. But at the same time. Mike is I probably don't... still alive, by the way. I don't know if the Mike and Mike's, like, I don't know who that is. No disrespect. I don't wish him death. <laughs> Obviously, we love know. the product. Is it named after a person? Was it a guy named Mike? See, we didn't also do our research on this. Well, we if we'd will, been paid, we would have. If they asked us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, listen, let's get into it. Mm. Enough of the jibba jabba. <laughs> let's get at a. Oh, this episode, we're, of course, discussing Bladis Bladis. Wow. And I said, you know what it is? I paused. I said it with confidence. There's that siren. Get used to these, dear listeners, because this is what the next two hours of your life is going to be, too. If I got to hear them, so do you. All right. Gladys Broadhurst. I don't know anything about this case. I couldn't be more jazzed. Let's hear a little now. Gladys Broadhurst was a blanche in her own right with an obvious enjoyment of men. How obvious? Well, in the span of 34 years, Gladys was married eight separate times. Wowzer. But Gladys didn't let a little thing like marriage stop her from seeing other men on the side. In fact, some of her husbands even overlapped without any of them realizing it. But when Gladys's greed for men turns into a greed for money, Gladys goes from committing adultery to committing murder. This case mirrors a soap opera complete with a doctor-patient affair, a person changing their will just days before being murdered, a femme fatale, and an evil twin. So which husband met an untimely end? And did Gladys get away with it? Christy Oxborough investigates. It really does. I had nothing else. I was, I always feel like I have to respond to what you've said, even though you're just saying what I told you to say. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I love it. I love yeah. it. Oh God. Um, so yeah, today is going to focus on Gladys, but before I get into her, I'm going to give a brief background on her family. Cause I'm always fascinated with when a person turns out a certain way, how'd they get there? And Welcome I don't my know life. if yeah. I I don't know if this family background really tells us how she got there because she's next level for me. I will never understand why she does what she does. So, William Ralphs lived in American Fork, Utah, when he married a woman named Elizabeth 
in May 1841. They had 10 children. However, five of them sadly did not survive. Elizabeth suddenly became ill and died in 1863 at the age of 44. A few years later, William married a widowed neighbor named Marianne Hansen Johnson, who emigrated from Denmark in 1868. She had five children of her own, but in May 1872, William and Marianne had a son together named William Benjamin Ralphs. Now, the son, William, got married at 19 to a 16-year-old girl named Melinda Shelley. Sadly, Melinda died of unknown causes in March 1898. The same year, uh, William was a captain in the cavalry during the Spanish-American War, including time spent in the Philippine Islands. When he returned home, he worked as a civil engineer. And weirdly enough, just like his father, after becoming a widow, William married a woman from Denmark. Hmm. Don't know. Uh, in this case, it was Anna Nielsen, who was born in March 1883. Anna was the first of nine children born in her family. At some point in the late 1890s, the Nielsen family emigrated from Denmark to Pleasant Grove, Utah. In November 1900, Anna married William. He was 28. She was 17. Not great. Uh, not great. Not great. Uh, the couple had five children. Jess, Red, Gladys, Sterling, and Bud. Jesse Williams, or Jesse William, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> I make no mistakes. <laughs> Speaking of Blanche, my God. <laughs> Those eyes, am I right? Oh. Uh, Jesse William, known as Jess, was born in January 1903. He spent 35 years as a firefighter in Reno, Nevada. He married a woman named Mary, and they had a daughter named Gloria. Jess passed away in September 1974 at the age of 71. Then was Eugene Benjamin, also known as Red, born in August 1904. Not much is known about him, except in 1929, he married a woman named Anita. They had a son named Lane in 1930, a daughter Barbara in 1932. From the best I can tell, Red and Anita got a divorce, and she remarried in 1940, and then within the next few years, Red married a woman named Elsie. He died in November 1977 at the age of 73. Uh, the third child was Gladys, who we're going to put a pin in because we're going to get into her in a minute. Uh, the fourth was Sterling Lars, which is a very uh, European sounding name, uh, born in January 1908. In 1938, he married a woman named Gwendolyn. And 10 years after that, they welcomed a son named Richard. Sterling died in October 1982 at the age of 74. The youngest Ralph's child was Clifford Budd, known simply as Budd. He was born October 1909. At some point, he married a woman named Jacqueline before joining the U.S. Army and being sent overseas. William Ralph's, uh, their father, died in December 1942 at the age of 70. His wife, Anna, died nine months later at the age of 60. She suffered a heart attack when she received a returned letter that she had written to her son, Bud, while he was serving in Sicily for the U.S. Army. She believed that the re letter being returned to her meant that Bud was missing in action, and the shock of it in the moment caused a heart attack. The fire department was called. They were unable to revive her. And if that isn't sad enough, it turns out Bud was not missing in action. The letter was returned to Anna simply because she wrote the wrong address on it. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Bud did die 17 months later from wounds he received during the war. He was 34 at the time. So... We quickly went over the four boys from the Ralphs family and the fact that most of them married once in their lifetime. So it's time to discuss the only daughter in the family who kind of went a different route when it came to marriage. Gladys Ralphs was born June 25th, 1906 in American Fork, Utah. She was raised in the Mormon faith 
She played piano and accordion in the family's band, which was known as the Ralph's Novelty Orchestra. The band toured to various churches. Gladys was said to have a beautiful singing voice. On May 19, 1927, Gladys married William Hendricks in Minidoka, Idaho. Both were 20 years old at the time. Since Gladys was not given a middle name at birth, and there was not one listed on her birth certificate, Gladys decided to give herself a middle name. So she listed her name as Gladys June on the wedding application. She also took her new husband's last name, but then reverted to her maiden name about a year later when they got divorced. William Hendricks got remarried in November 1930 to a woman named Minnie Blanche Cole. They had three children and remained together until Minnie's death in 1974. And then about 14 months after that first wedding, not after they divorced, after the first wedding in August 1928, Gladys had her second wedding. On the marriage application this time, she claimed to be single. She should have listed herself, of course, as divorced. Uh, it's also been suggested that Gladys may have cheated on husband number one with husband number two, and that she outright left husband number one for number two, or no, yes, I, I'm already confused by the numbers. Yeah, she uh, she may have left him, her first husband, for this new guy. Uh, the second was a railroad clerk named Albert Richardson. Albert was 23 at the time of the wedding. Gladys was 22. Canadian fun fact, Albert was born in Rimby, Alberta, which is about 38 miles or 62 kilometers northwest of Red Deer. Gladys and Albert were married at the courthouse in Logan, Utah, just hours after the marriage license was issued. I don't know how long they officially lasted as a married couple, but by March 1931, which was like about two and a half years later, Gladys was listed as single and was again going by her maiden name. So they may have lasted that full two and a half years, but it's unlikely. Yeah. But during her marriage uh, to Gladys, Gladys and Albert, or to Gladys, Jesus, to her, during her marriage to Albert, there we go. Good God. Gladys and Albert lived in Burley, Idaho, where Gladys became ill and needed to go to a chiropractor. The chiropractor's name was Willis David Broadhurst known as W.D. He established his own practice in Burley in 1924 following his graduation from the Palmer School of Chi Chiropractic Medicine in Davenport, Iowa. Despite the fact that Gladys was both married and a patient at the time, her and W.D. started an affair. Rumor has it that this affair led to the end of Gladys's second marriage, and things got bad enough that W.D. had to move his practice to Caldwell, Idaho, which is 184 miles or 296 kilometers northwest of Burley. So after the end of her second marriage, Gladys spent the next seven years as a single woman. During this time, she toured with her family's band. Then in January 1939, Gladys married husband number three, Carol Anderson. At the time, Carol was 31. Gladys was 32, but she listed her age as 30 on the marriage application. Interesting. She, al she also changed her middle name from June to Elaine. Huh. Yeah. Carol and Gladys moved into Carol's home in Westwood, California, where he where which had been established as the base of operations for the Red River Lumber Company in 1913. In the late 1930s, Westwood had the largest electric sawmill in the world. Carol and Gladys divorced within a year. And just 16 months later, Gladys married husband number four, Virgil Warner, at a Baptist church in Reno in June 1940. It was a large wedding, a ton of guests, including the governor of Nevada, which I'm not sure how they pulled that off. But at the time, Virgil was 28 and Gladys was 33. 
They met while Virgil was working at the Red River Lumber Company, where husband number three worked. Whoa! It is unknown if Virgil knew Carol personally or not, but since Westwood was not a big town, it is likely Virgil knew exactly who Carol was. And we don't know when exactly her hus- her and husband number four met. It most likely means she left husband number three for number four. Because, you know, she has a pattern. So She does. In July 1941, Gladys and Carol moved to Medford, Oregon, likely to escape the gossip of people uh, who would be like, did you hear? I think she left him for her, you know, for him, um, which makes sense. But again, it was a small town and was such a small period between husband three and four. I mean, of course, people are going to assume the relationships overlast, overlapped. And given Gladys's history, I'm not going to be surprised if they did. But by the end of 1941, Gladys filed for divorce and moved to Sacramento. But on January 28th, 1942, Gladys married husband number five, Leslie Lincoln. At the time, Leslie was 24. Gladys was 35. On the marriage application, she listed her age as 32. But that wasn't her only lie on that marriage application. Gladys also claimed this was only her second wedding. We know it was actually her fifth. She claimed she was a teacher. She was not. And speaking of things that Gladys was not, at the time of their wedding, Gladys was not officially divorced from husband number four. Yikes. Yep. Uh, Leslie, husband number five, uh, was a geologist who joined the U.S. Army in November 1940 after the wedding, which was performed by an Army chaplain in front of just two witnesses. Gladys and Leslie lived on the base at Fort Ord, California, before moving to Stockton for about six months. Leslie was then transferred to a base on the East Coast, and for some reason, Gladys just chose to stay behind and live in California by herself. She moved to Inglewood before moving in with Leslie's mother in Pittsburgh, California. After three months, Gladys moved back to Inglewood, until Leslie was discharged in November 1944, uh, and then they moved to Taft, California. While there, Gladys sent a telegram in August 1945 to her ex-chiropractor, W.D. Broadhurst. The telegram read, quote, Dearest Brody, memories of our nights together so many years ago still flood my dreams today. Have never forgotten you. How could I ever forget you? I'd love to tell you my story. Please write with your address if you're interested. She then included her address and signed it Gladys Ralphs Lincoln. So also including her current husband's name in there. So that's interesting. Um, WD responded 16 days later. He said he was excited to hear from her. He told her he wasn't married, had no children. Uh, So even though she'd only been living with her husband for about nine months since he was discharged from the army, Gladys was clearly planting seeds for husband number six. But she had to tread carefully if she was going to be successful, because it turns out Gladys was not only smart, oh, that bitch was conniving. I have no shame in calling her a bitch whatsoever. In her very carefully crafted response to WD just five days later, Gladys wrote, quote, My dear darling Dr. Brody, I recall with great fondness the time we spent together so many years ago. I've never forgotten you. How could I? Bit repetitive from her first message, but okay. But again, she's really trying to butter him up, going right to his ego of how unforgettable he was. Gladys then adds, quote, as for me, my health is still not good. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that you saved my life when you treated me back in Burley almost 20 years ago. 
Had it not been for your great skill as a chiropractor, coupled with your deep kindness, I surely would have taken my own life then. So now, psychologist hat, it seems like Gladys is trying to appear weak so that he will believe she needs him to save her, is how it comes across to me. And then she strokes his ego by saying, you saved my life. You saved our lives. We are eternally grateful. That was the bigger thing to me, was that it felt like she's very much specifically like manipulating his ego. That's what it felt like to me. Oh, 100%, right? Yeah. So, um, uh, it feels like she didn't want enough just to make him feel needed. She also wanted to ensure that he wasn't going to get suspicious of her and assume that she was only after his money. So she told him that her aunt Mary, who lives in Honolulu, had recently passed away, and the aunt had left Gladys nearly $3 million, which is equivalent to like $51 million in 2023. And yes, Aunt Mary Johnson did really exist. She was the stepsister of William and the daughter of Mary Ann and her first husband. Uh, Mary Johnson was born in October 1870. She moved to Honolulu around 1920. But at the time of Gladys's letter, Mary was very much alive. In fact, Mary would remain alive for another seven years. I'm also not, I, I don't know for sure because I never looked into I couldn't find her financials, but I also don't believe she probably had $3 million estate at that point. But, you know, so Gladys signs the letter with enduring love and then again uses her maiden name or her married name. Sorry. Wouldn't WD question it? You know, the married name? Of course not. Because Gladys told him that she was a widow and her husband had been killed in the war. From the best I can tell, during his time in the army, Leslie never actually served overseas. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Uh, In October 1945, Gladys and Leslie moved to Sacramento, where Leslie got a job working for Standard Oil. But even after the move, Gladys continued to secretly correspond with W.D., who had recently purchased a 160-acre ranch on the outskirts of Caldwell, Idaho, as well as a larger cattle ranch, approximately 61 miles or 98 kilometers south in Jordan Valley, which is located just over the Oregon border. W.D., who was 50 at the time, had recently retired from his chiropractic practice, which was taken over by his nephew, Floyd Adams who was only 17 years younger than W.D. So Floyd, his wife Lola, and their two children, Leroy and Trina, moved into the Caldwell house with W.D. in November 1945. They rented the land around the house to a dairy farmer. Uh, So, I mean, W.D. was doing good for money. At the time, it was estimated uh, he was worth about $153,000 which is equivalent to about $2.4 million in 2023. So, I mean, it's not exactly a surprise that Gladys is trying to get into his good graces Yeah. Um, at this point. So in early 1946, just months after reconnecting, Gladys sent a letter to WD in which she just outright proposed Even though she was still very much married to Leslie Lincoln, W.D., who thought Leslie had been killed during World War II, met with Gladys in a Sacramento hotel. They spent a romantic weekend together, and he returned home. I honestly don't know how Gladys was able to pull this off without Leslie knowing about it, and if that wasn't enough, while she was legally married to Leslie and openly pursuing W.D., Gladys was also casually dating a man named Leo O'Shea. It just 
sounds exhausting to me <laughs> if I'm being honest yeah um, this many men this many uh, no thank you so Leslie gets that something's up he files for divorce in April 1946 listing his reason as cruel treatment and while you would think that Gladys would be thrilled to get out of the marriage that she clearly didn't want to be in just four days after filing, well, Leslie and Gladys reconciled. Three weeks later, Gladys said she was going to take a trip to Reno to see her family. And she outright said Leslie was not invited because it was just a family thing. Um, but of course, she didn't want Leslie there uh, because Gladys was actually going there to meet with W.D. And when they arrived in town together... W.D. and Gladys checked into a motel, and the following day on May 20th, 1946, while very much married to husband number five, Gladys married W.D., a.k.a. husband number six. This is fascinating, and I I right? have a lot of thoughts already, but I'm going to save them uh, because I have a feeling this is going to take some twists and turns before we note it. Before we note it? We're doing Good great. Lord. Um, let's take a quick break, hit the can, grab a drink, and we're going to be right back with more about Gladys Broadhurst on this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We are, of course, discussing the Gladys, Gladys, Gladys Broadhurst case. This is, the, I've never had this much trouble with a name. Her name's a mouthful. Yeah. I am also on my second whatever doesn't matter <laughs> okay before the break we were getting into the real laundry list of husband's affairs all of the above that gladys yep. was indulging in um then you brought up she married number six yeah what's next a oh, spoiler alert more husbands and affairs <laughs> <laughs> i should have known oh boy um so yes she married husband number six before actually divorcing hu husband number five <laughs> what a rascal. Uh, and on the marriage application, Gladys claimed to be 35 years old. She was a month away from turning 40. So this time she took a real chunk off her age. Um, right. This time she also claimed she'd only been married one time before and she was a widow. Neither of those things are true. <laughs> yeah. But even if... um. Like, even her hus her new husband, W.D., husband number six, even he would know that was a lie about having only one marriage and it ended with a death. Because he might not have known that he was husband number six, but he certainly knew that Gladys was married more than once before him. When they first met in, like, 1930, Gladys was married to husband number two, Albert Richardson, they outright had an affair while she was married to Albert and he had to move his practice to another town because of it. That's right. So he knew about that one. And then Gladys reached out to him in a telegram in August, 1945, telling him that her new husband was killed during an air raid in world war two. And before someone suggests maybe WD thought Albert was the deceased war hero husband, he had a completely different last name than her current married name. So I believe WD was very naive when it came to Gladys. I also think he saw through some of her lies, but then maybe let them slide because she was a young, attractive woman. And he really looked at her through rose-colored glasses and just kind of accepted it because he thought she was a 35-year-old woman. And he was... 50 so he was like oh this younger woman is interested and i am assuming he was still interested in her from like the 15 years before when they met so i think he yeah. just couldn't quit her there i'll say it yeah but to be clear regardless as to what wd may or may not have known gladys is the one who is in the wrong here i don't just mean morally but i also mean legally because marrying one person while you are legally married to another 
is outright bigamy, which is a criminal offense in all 50 states. Depending on the state, it's either a misdemeanor or a felony. But being legally married before her sixth wedding uh, wasn't Gladys's only lie. She was also hiding an addiction to Nembutal, which is used as a sleep aid. A typical dose at the time was about three grains, which is equivalent to like 195 milligrams. Gladys, at the time, was taking about five to ten times the regular dose, so nearly like 2,000 milligrams. Gladys was also lying to husband number six about husband number five. She told W.D. that Leslie had died in the war. Uh, and when W.D. came to Sacramento for a visit, Gladys realized, oh, shit, if we're in the same town as my not dead husband, there's a possibility we might run into him somewhere. So Gladys told W.D. that Leslie had a twin brother named Lester who learned of Gladys's re recent inheritance. So he planned to assume the identity of his dead brother to take the money. Gladys claimed Lester was physically abusive towards her and she feared for her life. She described him as vicious, brutal, and a psychopath. Oh my God. Gladys even went so far as to say that Lester and Leslie were so identical the only way to tell them apart was a very small birthmark that Lester had behind one of his ears. Uh, the other big difference between them is that Leslie existed and Lester did not. <laughs> Just, yeah. you know. There's, there is also to, that. To be clear. Uh, I find it shocking that not only would she lie about her husband being dead, but that she'd create an evil twin just in case WD ever saw Leslie in person. But there's another reason that she used the evil twin lie, because Gladys needed an excuse for them to keep their new marriage a secret. And W.D. fully agreed, seemingly believing that Gladys's life would be in danger if this supposed twin knew the truth. After a brief honeymoon weekend in Reno, W.D. returned to his ranch in Idaho and Gladys returned to Sacramento. Why didn't Gladys go home with her new husband? My guess is she had to make arrangements to officially leave husband number five so she could go live with husband number six. And maybe because the wedding was so sudden, she didn't have time to fully prepare. But thanks to the lie about the evil twin, W.D. didn't even consider it, or didn't even question it, when Gladys returned to California. If nothing else... The lie bought Gladys time until she figured out how she was going to leave Leslie. So Gladys goes to Sacramento. The newlyweds continue their relationship through letters and telegrams. W.D. referred to Gladys as wifey and little mama, which makes me uncomfortable, but that's beside the point. Also, different era. It's funny that... <laughs> It's it funny feels, that that that's come back around. It feels like. Oh, I didn't. I thought wifey was like a fairly recent thing. I didn't think people so did were I. using it that long ago. Did Did you think that little mama had been around <laughs> since? I. I can't really think about it. I just. I mean, look. Is there something hot about like. Mama, sure, I get that. Um, thank you very much, AC Slater. But yeah. um, little, something about little mama just makes it feel very much like you think of her as a child. It just feels like a more modern term to me also. Sure. You yeah. Know? I mean, this is 1946, which is wild. So just like every 80 years, it circles back. It's like Final Destination or something. <laughs> I, yeah, I like that. Um, oh, there was also a point in one of the letters where W.D. said, and this is a quote, darn my daddy, he does love me. Referring to himself as daddy, but then also speaking for Gladys? No, thank you. Not my style at all. Um, he also, in that same letter, referred to himself as her prince. 
So at this point, she'd, she'd done her work. Assignment successful for what she was planning to do uh, to get him this enamored with her. She, she did it. Uh, WD also sent Gladys money orders of one to $200 at a time, which was equivalent to about 1500 to 3100 in 2023. Uh, but if WD believed that Gladys received some massive inheritance from her aunt, why was he then sending her money? Because according to Gladys, with an inheritance of that size, oh, it could take months or even years to fully settle it, especially because it's we're dealing with Hawaii, and oh, that's just going to take so long. So you never know when it'll come. I oh, mean. boy. Yep. Uh, WD's plan was to go to Sacramento on July 1st and bring Gladys home with him. They got married, I believe, uh, May 20th. So, but Gladys ended up needing to leave sooner than July 1st because Leslie discovered a letter from WD to his wife in mid-June. And for whatever reason, instead of contacting WD about it, Gladys wrote a letter to WD's nephew, Floyd, uh, who took over the business for him and was living with him. Gladys, in the letter, admitted that she and WD were married, which was news to Floyd, because WD had been keeping it a secret. Gladys then said uh, she hadn't eaten in five days. She said she was being kicked out of her apartment. She said she had blood poisoning in her left leg. Wow. So Gladys was writing to ask Floyd to contact WD as soon as possible and tell him to go pick her up. Again, why didn't you just contact him? But either way, she claimed it was a matter of life or death. So if her situation was that dire, why didn't she reach out to her own family? Don't worry. She uh, told Floyd why she couldn't do that. Because according to Gladys and that specific letter, her parents were both dead. Her brother Bud was killed in the war. Her brother Sterling was in a plane crash and recuperating in a veterans hospital in Los Angeles. She said it sounded like Sterling would never walk again. Gladys also claimed that her brother Red was lost in France during the war and found with a head injury and amnesia. Her brother Jess was the cap was a captain in the FBI, and they wouldn't tell her where he was because, and this is a quote from her letter, I imagine he's overseas and under government orders and isn't allowed to disclose his whereabouts. Convenient. From the best I can tell. The only truths in any of that were that, yes, her parents were both dead by this point and her brother, Bud. The rest really just sounds like a bunch of baloney, um, which is absolutely Gladys's style. But Gladys didn't just lie about her family. She also mentioned that fictitious inheritance. And she said, for whatever reason, uh, that she spent three years as an army nurse. No. No, she didn't. Gladys then ended the letter saying, quote, please don't fail me, and signed it, love to all. First of all, dramatic. Secondly, love to all the people you've never met who didn't even know you existed? Feels like a bit too much too soon. And I should know because I am too quick to commit. <laughs> Again, you're right. That that quiz stuck with me for life. Listen. Uh, when Floyd read the letter, he didn't believe a word of it. Probably because it was absolute bullshit. Um, but also because he'd never heard of Gladys before. WD had never mentioned ever getting married. Recently, at least. And he and Floyd were incredibly close. So Floyd showed WD the letter and WD explained the situation and said he's going to leave the following morning. He was like, this is serious. This is real. Drop everything. We got to go. When WD arrived, Gladys was in bad shape. Although, weirdly enough, there was no sign of blood poisoning. 
WD took Gladys to a doctor who said she was showing signs of an addiction to Nembutal. She spent two weeks in a hospital before she was released, and WD took her to his ranch in Jordan Valley. Gladys liked the ranch, especially the six male ranch hands. Oh, boy. And because Gladys was outgoing and fun, the ranch hands liked her, too. But life wasn't all perfect, because despite Gladys skipping town, there was still that pesky little issue of her marriage to husband number five, Leslie Lincoln. Leslie had filed for divorce on the grounds of cruel treatment, but after discovering Gladys's relationship with W.D., Leslie added bigamy to that divorce filing. So a request to serve an amended divorce complaint was sent to a local sheriff who got in touch with Gladys. Lucky for her, W.D. wasn't home at the time, so he was still completely unaware of the situation, but Gladys knew she needed to return to Sacramento to deal with the divorce or risk that secret getting out. The problem was Gladys didn't drive and she certainly didn't want her new husband going with her and learning about her other husband. So Gladys told WD she needed to return to Sacramento to finalize her aunt's estate. Good thing she had that lie in her back pocket. Um, but it was haying season on the ranch, so W.D. was busy, and Gladys knew it. So when he suggested, yeah, I could take two or three days to go to Sacramento, Gladys said, oh, this is going to probably take closer to 10 days easy. She just really was choosing a chunk of time she knew he wouldn't be yeah. able to go for. So W.D. said Gladys could take his car but they needed to find her a chauffeur. One, since the ranch hands were fond of Gladys, it made sense to choose one of them. First, they considered 65-year-old Ben Mills, but he wasn't a very good driver, so they took him off the list. Next on the list, 35-year-old Jack Gallagher. But WD was worried because Jack and Gladys were close in age. People might believe they were a couple and... W.D. couldn't handle the thought of that gossip, so Jack was off the list. Then W.D. suggested 23-year-old Alvin Lee Williams. Thought he would make a great chauffeur. W.D. said, Alvin's so young, no one would ever believe that him and Gladys were involved. So W.D. offered to pay Alvin $5 a day plus expenses, which is equivalent to like $85 in 2023. Alvin agreed, and on August 5th, 1946, Alvin and Gladys took WD's 1941 Chevy Deluxe Coupe to San Francisco. On the first day, they made it as far as Reno, which is 340 miles or 547 kilometers southwest of Jordan Valley. They had dinner, they went to a movie. Afterward, Gladys said it was late, but she also said there's just probably no point in getting a hotel room. So instead, they drove out to the desert and decided they'd just sleep in the car. Gladys told Alvin that he looked a lot like her younger brother, Bud, who died in the war. And she asked if she could give him a brotherly kiss on the cheek. Oh, boy. He said yes. The next morning, they drove 32 miles or 51 kilometers west to Truckee, California, and stopped at the Big Chief Auto Campground, which was owned by Gladys's brother, Sterling, who shockingly had not been in any sort of plane accident, plane crash. There we go. Gladys, at, I, I assume at this campground that it was like, there were large cabins where multiple bunks were inside each cabin. So Gladys was assigned to a pup tent on her own. Alvin was assigned to one of those cabins. But once Alvin helped Gladys get her bags to her tent, she told him she was afraid to sleep alone. So she asked if he would just sleep next to her. And Alvin agreed. Um... It's not hard to understand why Alvin would agree. 
Uh, he was 23 at the time. Gladys was beautiful and manipulative. The entire thing was calculated. The first day, they could have easily made it to her brother's campground, but instead she chose to have them spend an entire day and night alone. She said he looked like her brother, lulled him into a false sense of security, maybe to hide her true motives. The second night, she asks him to share her bed. Alvin did return to his cabin around 4 or 5 a.m. that the next morning, but after that, they just outright shared a bed for the rest of the trip. And of course, then it didn't take long for sex to happen between them, and soon Gladys and Alvin, or Gladys had Alvin just wrapped around her little finger. One of the weird layers of it to me is how Gladys told Alvin he looked like her brother Bud, who had died about 18 months earlier. And Sterling, Gladys's other brother, agreed that Alvin looked like Bud. So both Sterling and Gladys just started calling Alvin Bud. As though that's normal. Okay, that's, yeah. I mean, it's weird, but it's worse when you're sleeping yep. with it. Yep. It felt ah. like a grooming technique to me. It felt like a grooming Ooh. technique where it was like, you know, you remind me of my brother who passed and, you know, <clears throat> meaning that like, you can trust me. Of you know course. that kind of thing, but then the fact that the other brother said the same thing, and then we started. They start calling him by that nickname. That's that's something else. Oh, every single thing this woman does was specifically chosen and calculated. I fully believe it. She knew yeah. what she was doing. She was ahead of her time. Not unlike the names they gave each other, I suppose. Well, yeah, I'm building a profile. I can't wait. Um. So Gladys and Alvin stayed at the campground for 10 days. Whoa! <laughs> Which is wild, since she told WD the entire trip would take about 10 days. But at this point, Gladys hadn't even accomplished the trip's main purpose. Of course, she would send telegrams to WD, letting him know their progress. She told him how much she missed him, how much she wished he would come and stay with them. WD sent her a letter that included $100 cash uh, and the line, quote, Mommy, I love you. Mm -mm. <laughs> uh, Gladys responded, quote, signed, your little mommy wife. Again, to each their own, but that's a full ick from me, dog. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. thank you. Gross. No, nope. Nope. Not interested. On August 19th, Two weeks after they left on this 10-day trip, Gladys and Alvin finally made it to Sacramento. They visited with Gladys's brother Red and his wife before checking into the same hotel where W.D. met with Gladys just seven months earlier. It feels incredibly gross to me to choose the same hotel. I mean, it's Sacramento for crying out loud. Even in 1945, I had to believe there was more than one hotel there. I guess Gladys just had a preference when it came to hotels. But that means that when Leslie, a.k.a. husband number five, learned that Gladys was back in town, he knew exactly where to find her. Leslie called Gladys. She agreed to meet with him. Of course, she had told Alvin that same baloney story that Leslie died in the war and this was his evil twin brother, Lester. Gladys finally went to a lawyer and filed a response to Leslie's divorce complaint against her. An official trial for the divorce started in October 1946, but since Gladys didn't personally attend, the divorce was quickly granted, although for whatever reason it didn't become official until October 1947. Leslie Lincoln continued to work for Standard Oil and then PG&E for 35 years. He married a woman named Roberta in 1946, which I'll point out, their divorce wasn't officially legal and final until October 1947, but he married a woman in 1946, and he also had the gall to be like, oh my God, she's a bigamist for being married to two people at one time. Ah, you did the same thing. I know she was cheating on you and it was a harsher reality in the moment, but 
Hi, pot. This is Kettle. Anyhow. Yep. Yep. Leslie and Roberta remained together until her death in 1989. Together, they had four children, five grandchildren, and seven great-grandchildren. Leslie died in May 2011 at the age of 94. So at the point in this trip, Gladys finally dealt with the divorce, which was the entire purpose of that trip to begin with. So it's time for her to head home, right? Nope. Gladys and Alvin stayed in California for another four weeks. Oh, she even went so far as to send WD telegrams to tell him how much she missed him, how lonely she was. Gladys suggested WD come visit her. And then she wrote, and this is a quote, send whatever money you feel, or sorry, send whatever you feel like in money. And not only did WD not question the incredible length of this trip, but he also took the time to make a small visit. While in California, WD spoke with Alvin, who told him he was actually interested in staying in California because he thought he might start working at the campground for Gladys's brother. WD was like, great, can't wait. He then paid Alvin in full for his time as Gladys's chauffeur. And the next day, WD took the bus home alone. Now, my question here is, why did he take the bus? His car was in California, his wife was done with her legal business, and his wife's chauffeur had just quit. So why didn't WD drive his own car home? Especially when Gladys didn't drive, and at that point, had no reason to remain in California. Your guess is as good as mine as why this worked the way it did. But Gladys sent W.D. a letter dated September 10th, 1946, in which she wrote that she loved him and missed him and was sad that his recent trip was so short. She then said she really hoped she'd be home soon. It's just the fact that he didn't see through this? <laughs> Wild to me. But if she really felt like she oh was so sad about not being home... She could have gone home weeks earlier, but it's obvious that Gladys was enjoying living her life and doing whatever she wanted and didn't want to return to her husband or the small town that he lived in. And in classic Gladys fashion, one week after sending her husband that letter, Gladys and Alvin went to Reno and got married. For those keeping oh, track, that is no. husband number seven. While still legal at that point she was still legally married to husbands five and six but was six technically legal at that point like would it be found null and void i think if they figured it out yes wowzer yeah um well on the marriage application to marry alvin gladys used a fake name elaine hamilton she also claimed she was 30 Oh, uh, when she was 40. It's amazing. Every marriage she gets younger. Um, She also claimed she had only been married once before and that her husband was dead. Still playing that card. Uh, Alvin used his real name, but he claimed he was 28. Instead of the 23, he actually was. He also claimed he'd been married once before, but that it ended in divorce. Uh this was absolutely his first marriage. There was no divorce for him. I feel like he wanted to sound older. And that's how he did it. Uh, days later, they finally started heading back home. However, they made a stop in Ontario, Oregon, which is about 30 miles or 49 kilometers north of home, which at the time uh, they were headed to Caldwell. They arrived around 11 p.m. and decided, oh, it's just too late to go any further. They were 30 miles away. They finally, they the, th the other thing about it is to get to Ontario, Oregon, they had to literally drive past where they were going. Or at the very least, go around it to get to Ontario, Oregon. So it's just wild that they were literally just dragging this trip out in any way possible. The next day, Alvin and Gladys visited with some of Alvin's family members. 
They attended a dance in Homedale, which is 31 miles or 50 kilometers south of Ontario, Oregon, meaning they drove even closer to home without going there. They left the dance around 2.30 a.m. And since it was so late, they just decided to go all the way back to Ontario, Oregon and stay at a hotel. It would have been less than half the distance to just drive home from there at that point. But we all know Gladys had zero interest in actually getting home to her husband. The following day, they slept in, they had lunch, they went to see a double feature, they randomly just drove around until dark, and then they headed to the ranch in Jordan Valley instead of the ranch in Caldwell. And then when they got to Jordan Valley, no one was home. So then they had to drive all the way back to Caldwell Ranch, so they didn't get home till 11.30 p.m. The trip, which Gladys said would take 10 days, took them seven weeks minus a day. W.D. then told Gladys he was planning on going on an elk hunting trip with some friends and his nephew Floyd. This was a thing that W.D. did every year, and it usually lasted about six or about two weeks. Gladys said she was concerned something might happen to him while he was gone. He told her he'd be fine. But Gladys was incredibly concerned, saying, well, if something happens to you, I won't have enough money to bury you. Oh, sweetheart, that shouldn't be your concern. But he didn't see through that. So to put Gladys at ease, WD opened a joint bank account for the two of them and put $1,000 in it which is equivalent to just over 15000 in 2023. He then went to a lawyer and had a new will made for himself where he left everything to Gladys. There was even a specific section written into the will that stated, and I quote, I do not intend to give anything from my said estate to any of my brothers or sisters or any of my other relatives. It is my desire that they shall receive nothing from my estate. It is wild to me how much faith WD has in Gladys at this point. Even yeah. after she left for seven weeks, he just did not question the length of that trip and then decides to change his will and leave her everything just two days before he leaves on this hunting trip. I guess he was just so in love with her, or at least in love with the idea of her, that he just didn't question her in any way. And there might have been something about the fact that W.D. believed that Gladys was 35 when she was actually 40. It's not that big of a difference, but he was 51 at this point. Maybe he just thought of her as so much younger and that just added to the appeal. I don't know. But Gladys was technically W.D.'s second wife. He married a woman named Cleo Nielsen in January 1942. From the best I can tell, that marriage ended after less than a year. So maybe W.D. was willing to overlook Gladys's faults and give her a lot of leeway because he didn't want a second divorce. Regardless, as to his reason for loving Gladys, W.D. trusted her completely, hence why he changed his will just two days before the trip, and maybe I'm being harsh about Gladys. Sure, she repeatedly lied to her husband and she was having an affair with a man who used to work for her husband. And maybe otherwise, though, she wasn't so bad. Wrong. <laughs> Unbeknownst to W.D., at the time of the hunting trip, Gladys was secretly plotting W.D.'s death. Oh! While on that nearly seven-week vacation in California... Gladys and Alvin went to see a movie. What? Well, well, they went to multiple movies, but what was one of the movies they saw? The Postman Always Rings Twice. It was released on May 9th, 1946 and starred Lana Turner and John Garfield. The basic premise of the movie is a restless drifter named Frank starts working at this diner slash gas station combo. It's owned by a curmudgeon named Nick. Soon after being hired, Frank starts having an affair with Nick's wife, Cora. 
Frank and Cora decide they're going to run away together. But then Cora realizes if her and Nick divorce, she gets nothing. So Frank and Cora go back to town and Cora convinces Frank to kill Nick so that they can just run the diner gas station together and just be happy and live without him. I'm not going to get into the whole thing, but it doesn't end happily for anyone in the story, including uh, Frank cheating on Cora, two of the three people dying, and one of them being sentenced to death. Jesus. So not exactly a positive story. And yet Gladys saw it and immediately thought, that Cora, she's on to something. It started small with Gladys telling Alvin she just, she really wished something would happen to WD. When they got to San Francisco, Gladys suggested that to Alvin that if something were to happen to her husband, then Gladys and Alvin could be together and they'd be rich. When Alvin didn't immediately get on board, Gladys told him that WD had physically assaulted her multiple times. This appears to be untrue. Shocking. I know. When they returned home, Gladys told Alvin that, well, if WD goes missing, then Alvin could just keep working as her chauffeur. And once WD was considered missing long enough that they declared him dead, well, the estate would automatically go to Gladys, and she and Alvin could then finally go public with their relationship and live happily ever after. And when WD mentioned the hunting party, Gladys decided, oh, it's time. Let's go ahead with the plan and make my husband disappear. The hunting party included WD and Floyd. Uh, they left around 6 a.m. on Friday, September 27th. Six hours later, Alvin showed up at the house claiming to be so sick. Floyd's wife, Lola, said to her, Alvin looked perfectly fine. But Gladys, oh, she was adamant that she was going to nurse Alvin back to health. After all, she was a, an army nurse for three years. Yeah. Uh, Gladys then had Alvin stay in the master bedroom while she slept in the bedroom right beside it. The thing about those bedrooms is, weirdly enough, there was a window in the wall between, that the shared wall between those bedrooms. And Gladys and Alvin rearranged the furniture in the rooms so that the headboards of the beds were both directly under that window. So when the window was open, you could literally reach through and touch the person in the bed in the other room or you know if you're a spry young 23 year old i'm sure you could crawl through a window um but alvin spent the entirety of that hunting trip at the house with gladys according to alvin whenever they were alone they spent the time planning out wd's disappearance gladys knew once wd returned home he would then want to head out to count the cattle at his ranch at Jordan Valley. And that's like 60 miles or 97 kilometers south of the ranch they were at. So Gladys thought the best thing to do would be to catch WD as he was driving from one ranch to another. Alvin and Gladys uh, then drove to Alvin's parents' house, picked up a shotgun and a bedroll. The plan was... Alvin would wait along the road leading towards the Jordan Valley Ranch. He'd act like he was having car trouble. WD would then stop. Alvin uh, would then shoot him and hide the body. Somehow, this was an absolutely foolproof plan to them. Absolutely foolproof. Um, but to them, I ask, if that's what you do, what about WD's vehicle? The plan was literally to just leave it on the side of the road and hope people would legitimately believe he just disappeared on his own. It's like half a plan with a, if I may, a very large room for error. Yeah. But, you know, we'll get to that. <laughs> Throughout the hunting trip, 
Gladys continued to care for Alvin. She took his temperature. She gave him sponge baths. Again, she was an army nurse. And even though they were trying to make it seem as though Alvin was incredibly sick, because otherwise he had no reason to be there, Alvin didn't exactly play sick successfully, because Lola was not convinced in any way, especially when Gladys, Lola, and Alvin went to the movies twice, they went out for dinner, they went to various clubs a few nights to go dancing. Uh, Lola later said she believed that Gladys was manipulative and evil, because she swears she saw Gladys and Alvin kiss when they were dancing, and they thought she wasn't looking. So they clearly weren't very careful around Lola, if she caught them. So what made them think that they could secretly pull off a murder if they could not secretly pull off an affair? Clearly Gladys had an unwavering faith in her plan, even though she was asking a man who couldn't stand the sight of blood to kill her husband and hide his body. But Gladys believed, well, she'll solve that problem. You don't like the sight of blood? Here's a two-quart bottle of whiskey. That'll help. Thanks, Gladys. Super helpful. So to pull off the plan, Alvin needed a vehicle. So they bought a cheap Model A Ford Coupe for about $200. The car came with a set of tools, including a very large, heavy crescent wrench. So for whatever reason, that made them alter their plan. They decided that Alvin would use that wrench to hit WD but, and then only shoot him if necessary. Oh, boy. So they've now made a bad plan even worse by asking a man who doesn't like the sight of blood to bludgeon another man to death, which I think is safe to say um, would leave a lot more evidence yes. than shooting him. But what happens, um, despite this carefully crafted plan um what if what if the police get suspicious of gladys or alvin's involvement don't worry gladys has that covered too she said she'd just blame the whole thing on lester lincoln that evil twin of her fifth husband gladys said she'd simply tell the police that lester had threatened to kill her husband after he learned that gladys had remarried which again is only half a plan. Lester is a decent suspect, but it would be so easy for the police to unravel the entire evil twin story. And once they learned that Gladys lied about Leslie, they'd quickly turn their suspicions to her. Yes. I, I think Gladys truly believed that if the police ever suspected her, that she could charm them into believing whatever story she wanted them to. I also wouldn't be surprised if she had a backup plan of throwing Alvin under the bus and claiming he killed W.D. to be with her. So we know the plan. Now we just need to know, did they pull it off successfully or as successfully as they believed they would? Well, the hunting party returned Friday, October 11th. W.D. said he would head to Jordan Valley Ranch on Monday morning. So on Sunday night, around 11.30 p.m., Alvin took his bedroll, the whiskey, a satchel of clothing, the shotgun, and that massive wrench, and drove to Jordan Valley. When he left, he told everyone he was headed to Nevada, uh, which is absolutely suspicious to randomly head out at 11.30 at night. Neither here nor there. But W.D. was so happy to have Alvin leave he didn't even question it. He was just like, okay, bro, see you later. Turns out WD was quite frustrated that Alvin seemed to just stick around, even though he'd previously told WD he wanted to stay in California. WD didn't like Alvin being around his wife. It's possible deep down he knew about the affair, maybe turned a blind eye because he wanted to keep her happy, or maybe he just was truly naive and trusted Gladys completely even though she absolutely cheated with him years ago when he had to move his practice. Alvin drove to the junction of the Idaho-Oregon-Nevada Highway, a.k.a. Route 95, and Sucker Creek Road, where he pulled over and waited for daylight. 
In the morning, Alvin popped the hood of his car and just sat and waited. Unfortunately for him, W.D. wasn't in a big hurry to get there, so he left later than planned. He stopped in a nearby town and had lunch with a friend. They visited for hours. Uh, thankfully for Alvin, Sucker Creek Road rarely had traffic. However, a local farmer named Joseph Fenwick and his farmhand, Clifford Dixon, drove past Alvin's car on their way to burn some sagebrush on Joseph's property. They first noticed Alvin at 8 a.m., but thought nothing of it. They passed him again at 11.45. And then when they passed him a third time, like an hour later, they decided they were going to stop and ask if Alvin needed help. Alvin said he was having car trouble, but no problem. My friend went to town to get replacement parts. Around 3.30 p.m., W.D. finally appeared on the road. Alvin waved him down. W.D. pulled up past Alvin's car, pulls over. Uh, at the time, W.D. was pulling a horse trailer, which uh, he was using to transport his horse, Rex. W.D. asked if Alvin was having car trouble. And this right away, um, the last time you saw this man, was 11.30 the night before, and he told you he was headed to Nevada, and you see him on the side of the road near your second home, and there's no part of you that's like, why are you here? What's going on? Yeah. What's up, man? Why can't I shake you? There's no part of you? Okay. So Alvin said his gas line was clogged, and he needed pliers. So WD goes to his truck, gets pliers, brings them to Alvin. Alvin said he was starting to loosen the connection on the gas line, but he was so nervous, his hands started shaking. So WD took the pliers, loosened the connection for him. Alvin looked around, coast was clear. So he picked up that big wrench and hit WD on the head multiple times. Alvin later said he tried to quit, but he could hear Gladys in his head telling him not to fail her. Oh, God. Yeah. Which uh, you guarantee she said that to him at one point because there was that letter she had written to the nephew saying, don't fail me. So it just feels classic her. Yeah. According to Alvin, after being hit in the head, WD pulled out a jackknife and threatened to kill Alvin. So Alvin grabbed the shotgun, which was already loaded. He told W.D. to stay away from him or he'd shoot. W.D. took a step forward. Alvin pulled the trigger. W.D. dropped the knife and clutched his chest as he fell onto the road. Alvin then dragged W.D.'s body behind some sagebrush, grabbed the knife and a hat that W.D. had been wearing, and went to W.D.'s truck. Alvin drove the truck over the hill, then took the horse out of the trailer, rode the horse back to the crime scene instead of just walking back. Uh, he let the horse then go free at that point. He then gets in his own car, drove to a nearby town, got gas, grabbed a soda or a, a pop uh, for our Canadian listeners. Alvin then returned to the scene, hid the body, returned to the ranch, told Gladys it was done. She said, did you destroy the evidence? He said, no. She said, go do that. Then you can come back. The following day, October 15th, the sheriff in Vail, Oregon, got a phone call from Floyd Adams, a.k.a. W.D.'s nephew. He said his uncle's horse and truck had been found near Jordan Valley, but there was no sign of his uncle. Floyd mentioned his uncle had a dairy farm outside of Caldwell, as well as the ranch near Jordan Valley, and on the afternoon of October 14th, the uncle had left Caldwell to drive to Jordan Valley. Around 9 p.m., Lionel Crawl, the fire chief of Caldwell, noticed a horse running along the side of the road. Lionel recognized the horse as belonging to W.D., so he took the horse to a nearby farm, and then went out searching for W.D. When there was no sign of him, Lionel went to a, the hotel in Jordan Valley and called Floyd. 
The following morning, a search party was formed, including people on foot, some on horseback. They searched the area where the horse was found, as well as the area where WD's truck was located, found nothing. Joseph, the farmer who saw Alvin's car on the road multiple times that day, later testified he heard a gunshot around 3.40 p.m. that day. He said when he passed by that same spot around 6 p.m., the vehicle and the man he saw were gone. Floyd told the police his uncle had recently married Gladys. Uh, Floyd described Gladys as strange and inappropriate. He said Gladys didn't move in with WD until a month after their secret wedding and that she only stayed for four or five weeks before she left on a seven-week vacation without her husband. Floyd's wife, Lola, said the morning after WD's disappearance, Alvin walked into the kitchen looking pale and haggard. She said his eyes were bloodshot and his hands were shaking so badly that he spilled a cup of coffee and couldn't light a cigarette. While the police were speaking to WD's family, Alvin suddenly became concerned that that farmer who passed his car multiple times might be able to tell police he saw that car. So his first bright idea to make his car look completely different was to change the tires. So he went oh, to a used car lot and changed his tires from 21 inch to 16 inch. Okay. He then got another bright idea. So he stopped at a hardware store and bought two cans of paint and a paintbrush. No. Drove to the outskirts of town, painted the car black, then parked it on a street near the church and hitchhiked back to the ranch. Farmer uh, Joseph Fenwick came forward, told the police about the man he saw on the road three times that day. Joseph was able to describe to describe the man's car as a blue Model A Ford. Police confirmed that Alvin had recently purchased a blue Model A, Model A Ford. So police did a search for Alvin's vehicle, and they found it parked near a church, freshly painted. And when I say freshly, I mean the paint was still tacky when they found it. Inside the car, police found a partial bottle of whiskey, a satchel of clothing, paint cans, and a used paintbrush. So I guess Alvin's plan to hide the vehicle in plain sight just did not work. The sheriff went to the Caldwell house to interview Gladys, who introduced Alvin as her chauffeur and bodyguard. <laughs> ah, the police drove Alvin to his car, and they were like, hey, is, is, that, is that your car? And Alvin went, yeah. <laughs> so the whole point of painting the car just a pointless waste of time the police suggested that alvin was a suspect and gladys told them impossible you know who a real suspect is my evil twin brother-in-law stop <laughs> it this is insane yeah. she said that that evil twin lester wanted the two million dollar estate that gladys's father had left her which didn't exist. <laughs> Again, she's, I can't, I can't with this one. Days later, on October 17th, Gladys claimed that while letting the dog outside, she discovered a note attached to her front door. The note read, quote, Your cowboy strong arm didn't do it, but don't start anything or I'll get you the same as I did, doctor. I warned you, and I need some cash. The note was signed Sweet Pea, which, according to Gladys, was a nickname that Leslie used to call his twin brother Lester. Oh, boy! Except, of course, you know, Lester didn't exist. So Gladys showed Lola the note. And she said, just so you know, like, Lester has been physically abusive towards me. And he's been trying to marry me to get a portion of my estate. So the women took the note and a photo of Lester, which was really a photo of Leslie, took him to the sheriff. Gladys said Lester was dangerous. He'd spent time in a mental hospital. 
the woman does not stop doubling down on this evil twin thing. Police interrogate Alvin at great length, and he broke and fully confessed. Of course. He gave details about what happened to WD on the afternoon of October 14th. He agreed to take them to the location of the body and the murder weapon. Alvin took them to the junction at Route 95 and Sucker Creek Road. Police discovered a large amount of blood on the road. They then drove 11 miles or 18 kilometers south of the junction, then another 300 yards off the highway. From there, they walked another 100 yards on foot, and they found W.D.'s body hiding under some sagebrush. Alvin then pointed out a nearby badger hole where he had broken down the gun and just shoved it inside that hole. An autopsy determined that W.D. suffered several bullet wounds and three head wounds. His death occurred less than five months after his wedding to Gladys and just three weeks after Gladys and Alvin returned from their California adventure. W.D. was was 51 at the time of his death. So without realizing that Alvin had confessed, Gladys convinced a friend of Alvin's to say that he and Alvin were together on the afternoon of October 14th. Oh my God. But of course, by then Alvin had confessed. Um, So then Gladys was interrogated for about four hours and she stuck to her story. Police were still very skeptical of her. So they ended up putting her in a jail cell in Caldwell. Anyway, Alvin was in a jail cell in Vail, Oregon. The day after her incarceration, Gladys said she needed to go home, get some clean clothes. And somehow the police went, okay. So they drove her home. And if that isn't shocking enough, well at her house, police let Gladys go into her bedroom alone with the door closed for a considerable amount of time. Oh boy. Then they took her back to her jail cell. And once she was gone, Lola went in the room, checked it over, and she discovered scraps of paper that were hidden in the air duct about two feet from the opening. Those scraps of paper matched the paper that that sweet pea note was written on. And later, the the handwriting of the note was determined to be a, a match to Gladys. Two weeks after Gladys was put in jail, her lawyer, Cleve Groom, released a statement. And I quote, On behalf of Mrs. Gladys Ralphs Broadhurst, I wish to state that I am advised by her physician that a child will be born to Gladys Ralphs Broadhurst and her late husband, Dr. W.D. Broadhurst. Oh, boy! Police used a warrant to try and extradite Gladys to Oregon for the crime of accessory after the fact of first-degree murder. However, since the shocking pregnancy reveal, the extradition was denied. Gladys was then taken to a hospital to be monitored. Gladys claimed she was about five months pregnant. Uh, Her lawyer was very concerned that the stress was going to affect the baby. Um... But there was no baby because Gladys is conniving and was just trying to buy herself time and maybe some sympathy. Uh, Once it was determined Gladys was not pregnant, she was extradited to a jail in Oregon. Both Gladys and Alvin were charged with first-degree murder. Gladys's trial date was set for February 24th, 1947, while Alvin's got postponed until March so that he would be available to testify against her. The jury deliberated for three hours and 23 minutes, after which all 12 voted guilty. Five recommended the death penalty. Seven recommended a life sentence. So the judge gave Gladys life imprisonment. On March 27th, Gladys was taken to the Oregon State Penitentiary in Salem, Oregon. She appealed her sentence, but was denied. Gladys said was said to be a model prisoner. She taught her fellow fellow inmates various skills like cooking and sewing. She also taught them how to play the piano and the accordion. 
two days after she was convicted. In exchange for testifying against Gladys, Alvin was allowed to plead guilty to second-degree murder. The judge said, quote, I am convinced that had there been no Gladys Broadhurst, there would have been no crime. Alvin was also sentenced to life in prison. But, uh, life? How long is that really? Well, in Alvin's case, uh, 10 years and three months because he was paroled in August 1957. Wow. Uh, he married a woman named Nina Cantrell in July 1959. They had a few kids and he remained with her until Nina's death in May, or sorry, until his death in May 2010 at the age of 87. Gladys was paroled in July 1956 after serving nine years and four months. And while it's wild that she didn't even spend a full decade in prison after organizing her husband's murder, the most shocking part of all of this to me is that because of that new will that he signed two days before his hunting trip, Gladys was fully entitled to his money. I know that he changed his will to say that she should get everything, but since she was convicted of orchestrating his murder, I just assumed that, legally speaking, she would not be eligible for that inheritance. W.D.'s sisters agreed with me, uh, and they contested the will. And there were a lot of negotiations back and forth, Finally, both sides agreed to settle without going to court. W.D.'s three sisters got two-thirds of his estate. Gladys received one-third, which at the time was approximately $51,000, which is equivalent to about $704,000 in 2023. And while Gladys had the money, the one thing she didn't have for once was a husband. So in true Gladys oh, fashion, no, no. on January 15th, 1961, Gladys sent a Western Union telegram to Leo John O'Shea, a man whom she briefly dated in Sacramento in the mid-1940s when she was married to husband number five and dating soon to be husband number six. The telegram read, and I quote, Memories of our nights together so many years ago still flood my dreams today. I've never forgotten you. How could I ever forget a man like you? I'd love to tell you my story. The telegram included Gladys's new address. And if that telegram sounded familiar to you, that's because it was word for word the exact telegram that Gladys sent W.D. Broadhurst on August 20th, 1945. Weirdly enough, even though the telegrams were sent more than 15 years apart, Gladys sent both of them at 1.30 p.m., which feels like a weird coincidence. Yeah. Or just 1.30 is her usual Western Union time. I don't know. And Leo not only responded to that telegram, he officially became husband number eight on May 2nd, 1961, less than four months after Gladys initially reached out. They moved to Sacramento, where they lived together until Gladys's death in August 1973. When Gladys was buried, Leo put a shared headstone at her grave because his wish was that he would be buried next to her when his own time came. However, Leo's family disliked Gladys so much that when Leo died in October 1985, they refused to bury him next to Gladys and instead buried Leo at a separate cemetery altogether. Even though it had been 12 years since Gladys had died, Leo's family said that they didn't want Leo, and I quote, beside the embodiment of evil for eternity. Reporting for this wild ride of an episode, I'm Christy Oxborough. I am transfixed. I have thoughts. I have mm. theories. Let's take another break, grab another drink, hit the can again, and we're going to be back to talk more about Gladys Broad. 
it, Hurst. Broadhurst. There you go. Damn You're it. I was so close. Gladys Broadhurst on this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. Three on three. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, discussing Gladys Broadhurst. And can I just say out of the gate, what a tale. <laughs> what a story. I don't know it's how something. you found this. I don't know how you found this person or this story, but it is unbelievable. A um, couple quick thoughts, and then I want to really dive into diagnosing her because uh, of I'm also a little bit, I'm a little torn. I'm a little torn. I think I may have an official, but uh, okay. I mean, there's so many details. I love every time I start talking, another siren starts to go. It feels right. I think for me, the biggest thing is how comfortable she was with lying. Oh, yeah. In the small, in the large. That's a flag, obviously. Yep. Um, I like that she sent a telegram to WD. He responded six days, 16 days later. And to that, I say, if you wait 16 minutes to respond to someone who sent you a message on a dating app, you'll never hear from them again. Like 16 days. That concept is so far behind us. It's wild. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's again, there's so many things here, but I just want to I want to get to my diagnosing. Um, well, again, well, the way she why manip- I brought you this. <laughs> Thank you. Like, the way that done? she manipulated using like, well, you know, I wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for you. Like these are all these are flags, the mm-hmm. lying, the manipulating, um, the being addicted to the sleep aid. That's also something that we want to add into the mix. When we're, we're building this profile, right? Yep. Like feels like maybe she was self-medicating with that. The idea that she would just create a evil twin and that she thinks she could get away with it, full delusion, either delusion or like true delusion of grandeur, where it was like, I can outsmart everybody. Yeah. You see where I'm going with this in terms of building a lying about being an army nurse and a teacher. Yeah. Teacher, too. Don't get me wrong, but like, I don't know, lying about, about, military that's lying about being a teacher too don't get me wrong teachers are angels on earth but like i don't know that it's i also you know i think we've talked about on the show before like if you talk to someone who has been in the military and someone has pretended like it is just such a level of like it's such a dark thing to lie about like it's so unaccepted as it should be obviously but there's just a lot of a lot of energy around that. You know what I'm saying? Again, um, thinking that you can get away with it, thinking that it's okay. Unbelievable. The way that she literally groomed and manipulated Al- Alvin this whole time, mm-hmm. chilling. Also, every time you said Alvin, all I could think was Alvin, Simon, Theodore. Do, 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 do. Yeah. Yeah. Every I know. time. I know. Every time. It took everything I had not to add a bit in there where I yelled his name. <laughs> I get it. The fact that she would put false names on these wedding licenses, the fact that they were overlapping with other people, like, again, like, she is fascinating to try and figure out. Because on one hand, I'm like, oh, maybe she has, like, dissociative personality disorder. But then I'm like, no, that feels narcissistic. But then I'm like, it also feels antisocial. Like, there's so many different. Well, and here's the other thing. She may have a combination. This may be one of the first times that I'm like, I don't know that I can give this woman only one diagnosis. I think she have, oh, may sure. have more than one because it's wild. Um, the idea also of switching from the gunshot to bludgeoning with a wrench is such a bad idea. Yep. We don't have to belabor that, but anyone who listens to this show is a true crime fan. And, and I don't. all of you are screaming at home right now because it's just like, have you ever like planning to bludgeon someone? I mean, I know it was a different era, but like, what are you doing? Ooh. But again, that speaks to this like belief that you can get away with it, belief that you're smarter, all of those kinds of themes. I um, find it for me, um, it's just so fascinating that the only reason they chose to go bludgeoning is because they're like, well, we got the tools for free. We may as well use them. You also have the gun. Yeah, you, you didn't need them. 
like don't change the plan because you're like well it would be rude not to use the free tools it would that's girl math that it would be more expensive to not use this (laughs) free item it's like get over yourself can we also just talk about like the other flaw with this plan is a you're assuming that wd is going to pull over if he sees someone on the side of the road you're assuming that he's a good person which i'm not saying he wasn't but like that's also an assumption that like there's a huge margin of error right there he may just not yep. he may have been in a rush he may have been like yep. i'm so sorry I'll, I'll call someone in the next town for you like that was a huge margin of error and then the other is is that he knows alvin he knows yep. him so on one hand i know you could say well wouldn't that make him more likely to pull over. And I guess that could be true. But to me, I just think it's going to raise an alarm if he's like, oh, I'm pulling over to to be a good Samaritan and help this person. And then he knows the person. Like, I just think, I don't think it would be the slick plan like they were making it out to be. I think that that would actually be quite the opposite and look oddly like, what are you doing here? Like, I think it would like raise an alarm bell. A hundred percent. So I love the fact also Alvin just fully, fully gives it up, fully confesses. Yep. Um, the idea that she got someone to lie about an alibi, she could manipulate everybody. She's manipulating all these men into marrying her. She's manipulating friends into lying for her. Then she's claiming to be pregnant, which I want to remind you, I believe you said did come from a doctor, which means that she would have had to manipulate a doctor to lie for her also. There are so many things about this woman where it's like, what was it about her? What was it about her? What was it about her? That's when I wrote down antisocial, BPD, narcissistic personality disorder. What are we talking here? That's when I just pulled up an article that I would like us to now go through so we can figure it out together. Oh, I can't wait. This is an article that is in, that is that uh, has been medically reviewed by the Scientific Advisory Board. Uh, it's published on Psych Central and again, has been reviewed and fact-checked. Oh, I like that. It is called, what is the difference between a narcissist, sociopath, and borderline? And I'd love for us to get into it. This was written in 2018. So this is also where I shine. Just know that because I, I've done so much reading about these things. (laughs) So borderline narcissistic personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder, AKA sociopathy are the cluster B personality disorders, meaning that they are all intrinsically kind of similar and linked. Uh, This says it's helpful to realize personality disorders exist on a continuum. And also that the following three personality types, which we've just been talked about talking about can all exist in one individual to different degrees of intensity. That is to say, personality disorders are not mutually exclusive. And I think that's something that's important for us to realize in general, with us doing our work. Because I think I quite often want to try and figure out what it is. That's why I love true crime. I love the psychology of it. But I think that it is important to remember that these things are on a spectrum. And it doesn't mean that just because you have the traits of one that you can't therefore qualify as another. Um, It says it, it should also be noted, all personality disorders contain elements of narcissism. In particular, the traits of limited insight and empathy. Another important thing to remember when we talk about this, because as you know, and I say it on this show all the time, people throw around the term narcissist and I don't. If we're talking about a true textbook narcissist, which we do quite often when we're talking about serial killers, murderers, all of these kinds of things, these are the people who really have these traits. We're not talking about somebody who treated someone else poorly and then we're assuming that that means they're a narcissist. That's not our place. I think when we're talking about people who have taken a life, we can speculate because if you're able and have the capacity to do that, I think that speaks to having something going on. So the following traits are based on the perspective of those involved in relationships with personality disordered individuals. We're going to go through the table. God, this table makes me hot. It's well laid out. I may send this to you later. I think you're really going to enjoy it. I can't wait. So the first, we're talking about the narcissist. The narcissist typically lacks empathy, has empathy in the respect that they can understand others' feelings, 
just usually doesn't care about the other feelings. Mm. Has a need for narcissistic supply in the form of adulation, admiration, and approval from others. Borderline acts like they have empathy, has a need for validation from others, has an inability to be alone, is looking for the perfect parent. Interesting. Antisocial personality disorder, devoid of empathy completely, does not need anyone. And this is an important one to remember, again, when we're throwing around the term sociopath. We're really talking, and this is speaking in very broad strokes, but I kind of like it in terms of what we're talking about here today. Obviously, there are nuances to all of these things, and I am not suggesting that everyone who has borderline would then be be able to plan a murder. I'm not suggesting that at all. Because again, by the way, there's plenty of sociopaths and psychopaths, as we know, that live lives and, and have high stress jobs and thrive. It does not mean that you're a killer. We're just trying to figure this out through this framework. And so that's why I kind of like that they've kept this quite simple in order for our purposes. Sure. Now, back to the narcissist. Five primary personalities. Fascinating. One, normal, in quotation yeah. marks. Two, mean. Three, innocent. Four, detached. Five, victim. When we go to borderline or BPD, many different personalities, here are some examples. One, extremely kind, generous, helpful. Two, drama drama queen or drama king. Three, angry. Four, detached. Five, victim. Six, addict. Seven, self-harming behavior. Eight, liar. Nine, seductive. Interesting. And antisocial, finally. Charming, superficial, charismatic violent, abusive, dangerous, cruel, and detached. You see where I'm leaning. Yep. Narcissists have the following primary characteristics, a sense of entitlement, no insight. They are prideful, arrogant, pompous, needs narcissistic supply rather than true con connection, meaning um, being admired, approved, adored by other people. Sure. Easily bored. Also interesting. Huh. BPD, extreme fear of abandonment. Mm -hmm. Never alone. Habitually lies. Seductive, manipulative, moves very quickly in relationships, rapidly changes moods. Finally, of course, antisocial, no emotions. Cold and callous, easily bored, does not accept personal responsibility, has emotional shallowness. We got two more things to go through. How a narcissist views relationships, treats others as objects for personal gain. Interesting. Huh. BPD can never get enough from others, constantly wants more, enjoys spending time with others. Antisocial has callous disregard for other people. And finally, one of the moments or one of the categories I think we're really going to love to get into very quickly, childhoods. Childhood of narcissistic, poor attachment with a primary caregiver in childhood, might have been given everything, such as in the case of being overly spoiled, but was not attended to emotionally. BPD, extremely chaotic childhood, abandonment from one parent, Learned to manipulate and seduce rather than having healthy interpersonal connections. Antisocial, often experienced early infant attachment trauma and or abandonment and or severe child abuse and neglect. Uh, early childhood attachment traumas. So again, we're speaking very generally here and there is so many nuances to these things um, that we're not getting into. But I think what's interesting to me is I don't think that she's a sociopath. I don't think if we're going by this table that she has enough of those traits. And I also think it's interesting that this article was talking about how you have to remember that all of them are kind of like branching out of narcissistic traits. 
So we do see a lot of those traits in her behavior, but it is interesting. It does feel like she has a lot of borderline traits. Now, again, this is not lots of, lots of people have, have BPD and, and it's um, a challenge in many ways, but they live very, you know, they live normal lives is the point. I'm not suggesting that anyone with BPD is going to act the way that she did. Oh my God, there's a spider. Kill me. Oh my God, it won't die. Die! Sorry about that. I just love that I was being so serious and then I had to kill a spider. <laughs> ah, okay. Doing great. Thank you. The one thing that I find very interesting that go, I'm going on a tangent for a second. I'm going to come back to what we just talked about. Sure. When you said she had four brothers. Yeah. I was like, isn't that interesting knowing that then she was feeling as an adult, even as a young adult, she constantly had to have a man yeah. around her. Yeah. Interesting. Right. Yeah. I feel like if we got into the nuances that I'm sure are probably not even out there, but I bet you there is a lot of nuance about potentially how the boys were treated in that family versus her, what that dynamic was like with her mother, what that dynamic was like with her father. What did she view as their connection? I bet you if we dug into all of that, if we had that information, which I'm, again, I don't think we ever would, I think we would see additional information to back up that she definitely has a personality disorder of some kind, but it really feels again, her inability to be alone, you'd think BPD, but then also it's like, but it, it didn't necessarily feel like that was what it was about. It felt like it was also about using these men to get what she wanted. Yeah. So again, I, I do think final diagnosis, if you ask me comorbidity, I think there is, there is uh, multiple things going on. I don't sure. think we could give any sort of definitive uh, true diagnosis without a lot more information. But I do think it's very, very interesting the way the way that she also, got, again, got easily bored, which is something that we heard yeah. in the narcissism category and in the antisocial category, which is interesting that it's like she's meeting these men. They are all about her which you would think would be what she would want. And then it's like, she creates the chaos. She's like, no, I'm going to marry someone else and I'm going to have an affair. And like, she's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, it's wild. Right? One, one man was never enough. Once she got a guy to marry her, then it was instantly like, okay, well now that's boring. Yeah. So which again, the next one feels like a classic narcissistic trait where it's like she constantly wanted to have admiration adoration like and obviously when you meet someone new that's that's always going to be amplified rather than someone you've been with for you know two six eight ten years you know when you first meet somebody that that intensity can be much higher but it feels like i mean again to have been a fly on the wall right because it feels like what was the deal she was selling these guys I mean, with Alvin, with Alvin, it felt to me very much like she was grooming a man whose brain had not fully formed yet. Like he was 23 at the time, right? Like it felt to me like she was trying to groom him and 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 kind of get him to, well, obviously kill for her, which he did. So that feels like one thing. The yeah. rest of this kind of parade, it's it's so interesting because I don't feel like I see what she was getting out of it other than the game. Other than getting away with it. Yeah. Maybe the rush of like, I lie, right? I lie and they buy it and I've created a fake evil twin and they buy it. Like, but that's also what's so chilling right is that it's like if i may quote from hit major motion picture the dark knight a dog's chasing a car he would i'm like a dog chasing a car if i caught it i wouldn't know what to do with it i think i've quoted that on the show before but it's the same concept where it's like 
So in the end with WD and that murder, yes, she stand to gain. She was trying to get the money. She was trying to get him out of the way, et cetera. But when you look at all of those other relationships, what was she gaining by cheating and having affairs and marrying multiple men at the same time without them knowing it and carrying on these lies? The only thing that she's gaining from any of that is this sense of being able to get away with it, right? Like there's no other tangible benefit for her to do any of that yeah i mean it just feels like i mean of course i don't know for sure because i didn't i don't know what was going on in her mind but it doesn't feel like she actually loved any of them no so yeah what were you getting from it besides the fact of well i accomplished that done check that off the list all right well let's move on to the next and and yes i think wd was the only husband where she was like i'm specifically after that money yeah because she otherwise had a specific she... lifestyle she wanted and she wasn't getting that money anywhere else and otherwise yeah exactly but what's interesting about that is that she hadn't made any choices seemingly in her earlier choices with men that met that same goal it wasn't like she was constantly and i mean i know that we don't know the details of like every man that she's been with and like what their financials were but like it's just so interesting because you would have thought that if she was only into trying to get money then we would have seen a different pattern and she could have killed or had men killed prior to when she actually did one i think i mean i'd have to go through and look at them all again but i think wd was also the only husband that was older than her Everybody yes i do think you're younger. right the first because i remember the same age but other th- everybody else was all younger than her i did clock that as we were talking because she was always shaving a couple of years off her age on these wedding documents yep and then it was like oh yeah because the guy's younger than her which is interesting what does that mean to her right these are the psychological questions I would want to have answers to. What does it mean to you to be with a younger man? Does well, it mean that you feel that you can control them or you feel that you have something on them or how would she answer that question? You know? Sure. Uh, I did just verify um, her final husband, Leo was three years older than her. That's interesting. It feels like she came back around because she started in the beginning at the same age. Yep. Then got progressively younger. younger. Then WD, who was much older yep. for her. Then much, much younger, younger with Alvin. Yep. And then she came back to within three years. It feels like. Part of me wonders with him, was it a case of had she been trying since getting out of prison? Because she was out for like five years before she went after him. So is it a case of she was trying to get another husband and wasn't getting any bites. Is it possible she's like, well, now go for another trick of your book. Go and reach out to a man that I was with before and stroke his ego and tell him, how, oh, I could never forget our nights. Well, and the fact that she used basically, it was verbatim, right? The, it was. That's sick too. Because again, it's it's just showing that it's like, I'm just doing whatever I need to do in order to get what I want. Yeah. Which is so creepy. My other question for you is, can someone still send a telegram? Because I'd like to receive one. That's nice. Um, Unrelated to I all of this. Know. I don't know if I you can either. No. Um, I mean... I know you can still send like Western Union money things because I've seen like there are certain grocery stores here that you can send them through that way. But guess uh, what? You absolutely can. Anything. Yep. Huh. You can send them worldwide. Wow. I love the idea that you could send a telegram now. And call someone your little mama or whatever. And someone could find that and not automatically know what year that came from. Was it now? Was it 
the 1940s? Who knows? Yeah. Great question. I'd love to know how many telegrams get sent now. I, I just can't believe many. that it's that many. And it feels like it has to be a bit of a different system, right? Like, are am I going to get the card in the mail that's like, dear Lauren, I love the sound of your voice. Stop. I couldn't be happier to spend my weeks with you. Stop. <laughs> I can't wait till we're reunited. Stop. Stop. Love always, Christy. <laughs> well, that's the thing. It it always creeps me out when they when it says stop as many times <laughs> as it yeah. does. And I get I get it, but it just takes you out of the moment. I chose not to read stop in the in those yeah. telegrams. Um, Next day but- hand delivered telegram. Now, Western wow. Union apparently doesn't do them anymore, but this company called American Telegram does. I might have to send you one just to see. $23 feels pricey. Plus 79, plus 79 cents a word. Wow. Oh, I thought you were going to say 79 bucks to make the guy actually bring it. Um, you can wow. request a report of delivery. Oh, by the way, all charges include each word in the destination address. So I think you have to well, pay for each word of that as well. Wow. I mean, it definitely feels longer and pricier than an email. <laughs> now that was next day. You can do same day telegram for 35 plus 79 cents a word. Then there's something called the zip gram. Oh, wow. Now available with flower gram, roses and candy gram chocolates. I mean, if I'm sending some sort of gram, it has to come with something. Ideally, a song and someone in a costume. A singing telegram, yeah. That's all I yeah. want. Yeah. I mean, I don't want one for myself because I would be wildly uncomfortable yeah. to receive it and sitting there awkwardly while somebody is singing to me. <laughs> I would just feel weird. But um, yeah, I love that you would like a low school technology i think it's the same reason why i mean if someone made me a mix cd on an actual cd even though i don't really have any way to play it that would be yeah. very meaningful of course I, and to uh... that i say really <laughs> what i mean is a mixtape i would prefer a mixtape of course again yeah. no way to play it but that's not the point unless it's not you the point have, unless you have a boom box somewhere i do um, right there i don't think it works anymore though Thank you for Boombox. Yeah, of course. Um, I, uh, I, I mean, I get the the sweetness of a telegram, but you've heard my voice notes. Do you, do you get how pricey that would be? <laughs> they wouldn't have enough paper. Yeah, to write the full telegram. Well, I'm- and I, I also understand that it's like, yeah, you could do the same thing with an email. Like, why not just send an email? But it's the pro- it's going through the process. It's actually being physically handed something. Someone had to hunt you down. That okay? Maybe that shouldn't be. If I opened a door and there yeah. was a person standing there who said Telegram, I would just. I think I'd be floored. <laughs> this is how low. This is how low floored. the bar has gotten for me. Where it's like, oh, you sent me a two line note that cost you twenty bucks. <laughs> That's it. I think. I'd be floored if <laughs> I'm writing that down because that is one of my favorite things um, you have said. Listen, I... not to stray completely from the case of Gladys, but that was the other thing that just kept standing out to me. It was like all the talk about telegrams. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I just can't believe that she shared a home with someone and was sending letters and and get and receiving letters at their home and it took that long for someone to go i'm gonna look i'll get the mail today or to step in and go wait a minute yeah i mean i think it's just really a testament to like what a good manipulator she is oh yeah and no matter even if she had gotten caught she could have talked her way out of it somehow you know a hundred percent she is, um, oh God, there just aren't really words for her. Um, and just to clarify, uh, it, I know it felt 
like I was shaming him, specifically uh, husband number six, um, for not seeing through her games. Um, I wasn't shaming, just more of a, I'm shocked that no one, I'm shocked that he was like, oh, you need to go on a seven week trip without me, with that young man. All right. See ya. Yeah. And then her being like, I miss you. I wish I could come home. I would have been like, bitch, why can't you? <laughs> Except it would have been more like that uh, key and peel bit where it's like, and I said, bitch. It's like, you said that? But it, of course, uh, they're getting further and further away. So she can't hear them. Um, yeah. I don't think I would have said bitch uh, to her face. But again, to me, there's just no reason for it. Like when... Your, your husband uh, gets moved to another base on the opposite coast and you go, how about you go? I'll stay behind. And he goes, okay. I just, it's like, you. She, once she married them, she didn't want to be with them anymore. I wonder, do you think if it, do you think it was possible WD was having an affair? I mean, he started by having an affair with Gladys. So if she was like, I'm going to be gone for God knows how long. And he was like, that's cool. Is it because he was double dipping? I mean, it's possible. But if he was, then I'm just like, why were you with her at all then? Why does anybody she, with somebody she, in cheat? Fair. It's just she felt more trouble than what she was worth. Well, she just felt we exhausting don't... to deal with. <laughs> yeah but again we don't know we don't know what it was like behind closed doors you know what i'm saying like true that is very true could have brought some real value to the table that who knows sure everybody has their own unique set of skills yeah and listen there's a possibility that she made these men feel very special that she made them feel very you know wanted appreciated like they were her hero like that could be quite intoxicating yeah for anybody but i think certainly in the era and you know sure you know what i'm saying oh i know what you're saying <laughs> listen on that note what a story my goodness christy oxborough fantastic work as always i truly am blown away by the details of of this wild story and uh could not be glad uh could not be happier to know now about gladys broadhurst uh it hurts my stomach that she had eight husbands yeah it, it causes me physical just my stomach turns because i'm anxious at the thought of eight and the overlapping uh, it, it was all uncomfortable. I don't even know how I came across her, but I was like, eight? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm still looking for one. On that <laughs> note, uh, we thank you so much for listening to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. If you haven't already, I know you're what you you think you know what I'm going to say. What I'm going to say is download my single Sad This Christmas, add it to your playlists, put it, put the put the that song and the two covers. If you save them to your Spotify, that would be lovely. Save them on your Apple Music. Download to your devices. We're just trying to make it a hap, hap, happy holiday. You know what I'm saying? Of course. And then make sure you're following us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Your Crime and Cocktails, on Twitter at Not Detectives. If you'd like a little bit more bonus content, go over to uh, patreon.com slash True Crime and Cocktails to learn more about our subscription-based service over there. And of course, the only place to get official True Crime and Cocktails merch is, of course, truecrewmerch.com. So check that out as well if you haven't already. Christy, do you want to tell the people about next week's episode? <laughs> On the next True Crime and Cocktails, The Giggling Granny. <laughs> I know nothing about this case, and I could not be happier based on the name alone. So this is, of course, our uh, one of our patrons' poll picks. Um, if you go over to Patreon uh, and you sign up for our, our subscription service over there, you too can vote to choose one of the four episodes we cover each month on the main feed of the show. What a hoot. Christy, do you want to say goodnight to the people? Good night, Lauren's version of White Christmas. <laughs> Good night, telegrams. <laughs>